thanks to Step Chains for inviting me to talk to you today. It is the first time I've spoken about this in its entirety since the incident happened. Um, I'm following some great speakers talking about major accident hazards. My piece focuses on a major incident, but not one that came from the emergence of a traditional major accident hazard or one that I have personal uh, direct control over. However, I believe the human, uh, the human impact is the same, regardless of what led to the incident occurring. This is a personal account. It, um, it might be uncomfortable to listen to at times, but um, please think about how you might feel following a major accident on your asset. So before I talk about the incident and its effects, I'd like to talk a little bit about what being an OIM meant to me. And I'm sure this will resonate with some of the OIMs in the room and people who've been OIMs in the past. I loved that job. I took great delight and satisfaction in getting my crew through another trip where we had no accidents, no incidents, stable production, or having the project on plan. I enjoyed looking after all the people who came to work on Miller. I tried hard to instill in them a sense of a collective responsibility for keeping everyone safe. A real sense that they could and should stop the job whenever conditions changed, if they couldn't follow procedure, or for any other reason they felt wasn't right. Basically keeping everyone safe from the time they arrived on board until the time they left to go home. I vividly remember my first day as OIM, my first platform walkabout, thinking I'm responsible for all of this. A huge platform with nearly 200 people on board, a platform producing oil and gas and connected through pipelines to other assets and to St. Fergus gas terminal. The export pipeline, the gas export pipeline alone, 30 inch in diameter, 242 kilometers long, contained a massive hydrocarbon inventory, and I was very aware of that. From the cellar deck to the heli deck was 14 storeys. It was the equivalent of a high rise block, and you got a workout every day on your OI and walkabout. It was easy to keep fit there for sure. There were potential hazards everywhere, and I felt it was my job to ensure that nothing happened that would increase the risk of an incident occurring. It's Miller Field, the connection to all the pipelines that I had into and St Fergus, as I said, the gas export pipeline, 242 kilometres in length, 30 inch <coughs> diameter, up to 175 bar. Huge, huge potential there. So in making sure uh, I was equipped to deal with any incident, I'd studied Miller's design uh, through the safety case, and that design had been underway when Piper Alpha occurred. So with the Cullen inquiry ongoing, the project team had reassessed the design and it implemented a number of safety improvements with blast walls, separation zones, ESDVs, SSIVs, temporary refuges, and many other passive and active protective systems. It was an inherently safe design. All probably common stuff with modern projects these days, but back then it was, it was groundbreaking stuff. However, it wasn't a failure of the platform design or a system that resulted in our major incident. It's over 10 years ago, but I remember it like it was yesterday. On Wednesday, the 1st of April, 2009, I was one week into a three-week field break. During the afternoon, a news flash announced that a helicopter had crashed in the North Sea. It was around the time that the Miller flight was due in, and I had a bad feeling. I called my boss, and he confirmed my worst fears. It was a Miller crew change flight that had come down. He couldn't say anything more at that stage, but he was obviously feeling stressed. I offered to help, but he mobilised the BP's incident response team and he felt they had everything in hand. Uh, he felt they could cope at that time. I fired up my company laptop, first instinct, to try and find out who was on board the, the flight, and it showed the names of a complete drill crew and service hands, and also those of two BP maintenance technicians and their offshore planner. The rest of that day passed in a, a bit of a daze, I have to say, listening to news bulletins, scanning the internet, trying to get a definitive list of who had been on board. It became known that there had been 16 people on board, including pilots, and the search was ongoing, but there was little chance of finding any survivors. It was a shocking, dark period for me and my family. We fielded phone calls from friends that knew I worked offshore for BP, but they didn't know which platform, didn't know my rota, and feared the worst. And I'm sure there were many such calls we made that day to guys who worked offshore. We didn't sleep easily that night. We couldn't stop thinking about the guys who'd been on the helicopter and what had happened to them. The next day, as I continued monitoring the TV news and staff bulletins, I received a call from my boss asking if I was still willing to help. And I offered to go offshore on the next flight the following day. 
By this time, it was officially confirmed that there were no survivors and the search was now for the recovery of bodies. I then travelled to the Kirk of St Nicholas, where I met with the oil industry chaplain at that time, the Reverend Andrew Jolly. Some of you may well have met Andrew. Um, the Kirk was full of reporters and he led me outside and I said to him, is it to escape the reporters? And he said, no, I'm dying for a fag. <laughs> he was a known chain smoker. I didn't learn, though, until after the event that on the same day as the tragedy had occurred, Andrew had been diagnosed with cancer. The outlook was bleak, but he kept that from us all to prevent his own personal uh, news overshadowing the ongoing incident. He was completely focused on supporting everyone affected. I told him I was going offshore to Miller the next day, and we agreed to keep closely in touch as events progress. On returning home, I had a visit from one of the Miller techs who lived nearby. He was the kind of guy who never turned up unannounced. This was really unusual. He obviously wanted to talk about the helicopter crash. To my later regret, I didn't give him the time he needed. Um, I was busy packing up my house, I just sold it. And uh, seeing that, he left. It was only afterwards that I realized that he was scheduled to be on that flight. His name was on the list, but he and the other maintenance technician had got off the night before on a, an earlier flight. And he was racked with a, an unbearable sense of guilt, which he carries to this day. I also later heard that news reporters had turned up on our time. They'd got hold of an inaccurate flight list, and um, they'd turned up asking locals if they'd known this guy, assuming he'd perished. This in turn led to his wife receiving phone calls at home, expressing shock and sadness at his death, whilst in fact he was sitting next to her in the kitchen. To say they were shocked was an understatement, and so it went on. One of the drill crew was scheduled to travel home on that flight, but with 15 minutes to go, he was asked to stay and do another shift. He feels extremely fortunate to have been asked to remain and also experience his feelings of guilt. It was his crew and he should have been on the helicopter with him. The youngest person to die was uh, young James, aged 24, who worked directly for me as an offshore planner. He'd recently started with us. He was keen to do a good job. He'd asked if he could stay an extra day to get a comprehensive briefing from his back to back. She'd actually suggested the extended handover to him, and she carries a feeling of guilt to this day. And it's only 10 years later that she's felt able to attend a memorial service and still can't talk to his mother. So I travelled to the heliport early the next day to join a crew who were scheduled to go offshore. A flight had gone out the previous day carrying a, a senior company manager and a number of councillors. But this Friday flight was the first crew change flight since the incident. It was a, a catering staff crew change. They were all very nervous, getting a lot of attention from other passengers in the heliport. I spoke to the heliport manager and we were given a, a small lounge, a private area for our passengers away from general view. And it was a very quiet, sombre flight out to Miller. No one slept. But the flight passed without incident and when we landed, the thing that immediately struck me was how shocked everyone appeared. From the helideck crew to the passengers waiting to board to go home, Everyone looked stunned. Passengers were frightened about the flight home. The aircraft that had crashed on Wednesday had performed one rotation out to the Bruce platform earlier that day before performing the, the Miller crew change. And staff from Bruce later told me that they too were shocked and felt guilt. They thought they'd cheated death also. So the aircraft departed Miller on a calm, bright, sunny Wednesday afternoon. It got to within 11 miles of Peterhead when a, a catastrophic mechanical failure occurred, leading to the main rotor detaching, causing the rotor and the fuselage to fall to the sea from 1,500 feet. Anyone who's travelled offshore will be familiar with the picture. The majority of passengers would have been asleep, some starting to waken up as the uh, aircraft approaches the coast, when suddenly the aircraft failed, falling into the sea and breaking into pieces. None were to survive. I'm going to read you their names. There was David Ray, Alex Dallas, Ray Doyle, Gareth Hughes, Vernon Elric, Les Taylor, Neon Ferrier, Mikhail Zirafkis, Warren Mitchell, Nolan Goble, James Edwards, Captain Paul Burnham, Brian Barclay, Stuart Wood, First Officer Richard Menzies, and James Costello. 
They were aged from 24 to 63 years. These were sons, grandsons, parents, grandparents, brothers, all had left someone behind. Other than the air crew, I knew them all, some very well, others less so. But they were all well known one way or another within the Miller offshore community. When I arrived in the OIM office that day, the duty OIM and the senior manager were there in conference with the incident team in Aberdeen and London. We discussed the immediate plan for managing the crisis. The councillors were doing a great job getting people to open up to them and through talking, relieving some of the incredible tension that they all felt. The GTU OIM told me that the Deccan Helidec crew had refused to meet with the councillors, presumably thinking it showed weakness. So he told them that they were all fine, they could go back to work. Everyone else was stood down. And so it was that they agreed to meet with the councillors and opened up to them. Activity on board had been restricted to basic life support ops. The asset had been in phase one decommissioning, with process plant cleaning, flushing and isolation, and well abandonment, the main activities. The next few days were very stressful for us all, closely monitoring reports from the on-scene recovery team. An initial number of bodies had been recovered from the sea, but there was still a significant number to be found. I spoke to the crew of the search and rescue helicopter that was based offshore in Miller at that time. They were mainly ex-forces guys, no strangers to aircraft failures and fatalities, but they were all very affected by the fact that their aircraft had been scrambled. They were one of the first on the scene, and recognised the broken remains of one of their own company aircraft. They knew the air crew personally. They also knew on witnessing a scene that there would be no survivors. Around this time, I spoke to the GTOIM, who didn't seem to be coping very well. He was finding it difficult to make decisions. So with his and our manager's agreement, we booked him onto the next helicopter ashore. He didn't return offshore that trip. The senior manager then left shortly afterwards, and it was down to me and the crew to deal with the situation on board. We held daily town hall meetings, advising of updates and plans. Most people were very stoic. Others were so upset they had difficulty functioning. One of the crew came to my office and told me of a meeting that they'd had with one of their own managers who'd come out. The message they'd received was, guys, this is a tragedy, it's upset us all, but as a job to do, you need to go back to work tomorrow. No one had shared with me that this message was to be delivered. He wanted them to recommence the hazardous task of abandoning the wells. These guys were, in my opinion, in no shape to do that. And the potential for accidents would be significantly increased due to their distracted state of mind. After some calls with management on shore, it was agreed to send them home. The effect on the crew was starting to become known more widely than just on the platform. Throughout this time, reports were coming in of the search for the aircraft. We hoped and prayed that all would be located and recovered, and eventually the aircraft was found in the seabed and lifted onto the recovery vessel. It was with a huge sense of relief that we heard that all bodies had been recovered and the vessel was leaving for Aberdeen. On board, things were in limbo. Regular updates continued for the crew, and in a spirit of openness, we were asked to share technical information from the initial investigation and the likely cause of failure. But that was too much for some folks, and they asked to be excused from attending further updates. Around this time, our North Sea manager came out to the platform to talk to the crew, offer support and answer any questions. He himself was in a state of some shock. He was quite unwell, but he felt the need to continue with his visit. I had a pretty good relationship with him, and he told me that when a helicopter had landed in the sea near the ETAP platform the previous year, with all on board safely rescued, he would thought, that's it for my watch. He didn't expect another helicopter accident during his time as manager. Certainly with such tragic results. He was a great support to me and the crew when we needed it and kept in touch with messages of support and encouragement throughout. It meant a lot to know that help and support was available and that I had direct access to someone at the top if needed. All this time, I was liaising with Andrew, Andrew Jolly over a remembrance service to be held at the Kirk of St. Nicholas in Aberdeen and to be attended by the families, company reps, local dignitaries and royalty and was to be televised. We also spoke about Andrew coming offshore to conduct local services for uh, those of the crew that wouldn't be able to attend onshore. During planning with the main service, Andrew advised me that he'd managed to secure places for offshore staff. I thought, that's great. And then he said, we've got four seats. I went, well, that's not enough. So he came back later on and said, 
I've managed to increase this to 10 places. I said, Andrew, you don't understand. Lots of people are going to want to attend this service. Lots of offshore guys and girls want to come to Aberdeen to do this. So with that, he secured the gallery for us at the Kirk, which held about 100 people. Demand was such that tickets would be issued, and we then had a huge logistical exercise of determining who wanted to come and getting tickets to them. Back offshore, the platform was still in life support mode, but a decision had been made to recommence crewing up. We planned for the next passengers coming offshore to receive an onshore briefing to try and allay their fears. BP had already decided not to use the type of aircraft involved until the investigation was complete, when a further decision would be made on whether to recommence using them. Whilst this first crew were travelling offshore, a problem arose. The search and rescue aircraft, which was of the same type of the one that had crashed, was parked on our helideck. It usually took off and conducted training exercises around our crew change flights. But since our aircraft type was no longer being used by our company, was it, was it permitted to fly? I couldn't answer that. Our crew change flight was on its way out with very nervous passengers on board, and I wanted their flight and arrival to be as smooth as possible. This was Saturday morning, and I called a senior company manager at home to ask for help, and he agreed to get back to me as soon as possible. But the answer didn't arrive in time, and the crew change aircraft had to divert to a nearby platform, land there, disembark the passengers, until we got approval for the search and rescue aircraft to lift and for them to come and land on Miller eventually. So it was a very subdued group of people that I spoke to at that OIM briefing, and I had to apologise to them for their extended journey and additional takeoff and landings that increased their stress. For me personally, I'd come offshore in the middle of my field break. I'd stayed so long that if I didn't get off soon, I'd run out of rest time, allowing me to return offshore from my, my scheduled rotor trip. Try as we might, we couldn't find someone to come out and cover for me. I'm sorry to say that some people downright refused. And I couldn't understand why that might be until I realised that there was a genuine re reluctance to put themselves into what was a, an extremely stressful situation. Eventually, someone did come forward, a guy who'd been a Miller OIM some years previously. He was now manager of an onshore oil terminal for BP. He disrupted his own work and leave schedule to assist when he clearly had no obligation to do so. Since the day of the incident, the companies who had crew on board the crashed aircraft were providing great support to the families of those who had died. Families travelled to Aberdeen. They were met and cared for by company reps, put up in local hotels, and looked after as well as possible. Those company employees, who were also shocked and stressed, did sterling work and formed strong relationships with the families, many of which are maintained to this day. Grampian police officers also worked very closely with the companies and families, and they too formed close and lasting relationships. Over the following days and weeks, many personal accounts emerged, telling of the awful impact these deaths were having on the families, and in some cases family rifts appeared and remain unresolved ten years later. The incident was a, a major test for the oil and gas chaplaincy. I think that's a slide. The need for support for the families and colleagues of those lost, intense media scrutiny, the vast organisational challenge, including the remembrance services, could have overwhelmed Andrew and his staff. But they themselves were well supported by Oil and Gas UK, by the operators and the contractors, and showed how our industry comes together in the face of adversity. On the day of the remembrance service in Aberdeen, BP had provided a room in a local hotel as a meeting place for Miller staff before and following the service. For most of these folks, it was a first opportunity to talk to colleagues about the incident. Emotions were high and many tears were shed. We walked together to the kirk. A large screen had been erected outside to relay the service and it seemed thousands of members of the public had arrived to pay their respects. Once inside, the kirk was full the gallery filled with Miller staff from all companies in all parts of the UK. We wanted to pay our respects together as a team. Andrew Jolly conducted the service with great dignity and humility. The family's privacy was protected and they were positioned out of sight of the cameras. Following the service, Miller staff returned to the hotel, then onwards home. Families back to the hotel that had been their base since the incident had occurred, and from there, made their own way home to deal with the loss in their own way. Memorial services were held offshore. Wreaths were placed in the sea beside Miller. These services allowed the offshore crew to pay their respects, to express their own feelings of grief 
loss and in some cases feelings of guilt. Crews slowly returned offshore. Each returning crew was briefed onshore and again offshore, relaying the latest information, what the plan was, what we had to do to get back to some sense of normality. But the truth is we never did. Yes, we did re de recommence decommissioning at a measured pace. We did nothing hurried. Every task was assessed and executed. And we always remembered our lost colleagues. What became obvious soon after the service was that for those who hadn't been directly involved in the incident, there was a great reluctance to talk about it. Amongst those who were involved, there was a great need to talk. And we effectively formed a self-support network, giving time to allow others to speak of their sadness, regrets, anger, guilt. And that support network continues to this day. Some folks chose not to return to work offshore. Some came back after receiving much counselling. The HLO, who was the last one to come into contact with those who died, returned after six months and much counselling, and he was never the same character. I and many of the crew left Miller once we had completed phase one decommissioning. Wells abandoned, conductors pulled, top sides, pipelines cleaned and left hydrocarbon free. Those who left Miller at that time left with a great sense of achievement, but also with a great sense of loss. A number of the crew still meet every 1st of April at a short service in memory of those who were lost. And a number of the families and the company reps also attend. And it's sobering now to see those children who were babies and toddlers in 2009, now teenagers. They've all grown up without a father. And each year they light a candle in honour of a dad they never got to know. What surprises me each year is that instead of the numbers dwindling, they actually increase with many of the families expanding, and with some of those who were deeply affected now feeling able to attend. The ripple effect continues. The oil chaplaincy continues to support those affected by this and other incidents and anyone who's worked in our industry. The current chaplain, Gordon Craig, is always ready and willing to travel offshore and regularly visits current and former offshore staff and the families who are suffering some form of hardship. So back to being an OIM. Following this incident, my mindset changed. I still worked hard to take care of the crew from when they arrived on board until they left to go home. But I became acutely aware of when we had people in the air traveling out to or home from the platform and was always relieved when those flights arrived safely. I took more time over decisions. I took more time to think them through. So returning to the main theme of these talks, major accident hazards, my message is ensure that you know and understand and look after your major accident hazards and prevent them from becoming incidents. Ensure you maintain the necessary standards and look after the systems that protect you and your people from harm. Allow yourself sufficient time to make important decisions. So before I became an OIM, I was once given some advice that if struggling with a decision, think, how might that sound played back to you in front of a man with a curly wig? And that served me very well for a number of years. But since the incident, I thought more how that decision might sound played back to me in front of a man with a curly wig and also a grieving family. The human impact of a major incident is immense. It doesn't stop following the incident. It goes on and affects many more people than you might think. One mother said, after the fatal accident investigation into the crash, our men were lost. And no, we will never have closure. We relive this every day. This is not something that will go away. This, gentlemen and ladies, is a human impact. Thanks for your attention.